We're good. Hey everybody, welcome back to Fight Chat Friday. We are pleased to welcome a special guest today. We have Master Johan De Silva representing TKD Techers. Hi, James. How are you? Yeah, great, thanks. It's lovely to, to at least see you guys online. It's been a while since we've been in person. Yeah, thanks so much. been a minute. Definitely. You know, funnily enough, the last competition I was at was your competition, uh, you know, the Warrior Open in, uh, I suppose it was February 2020? 7th, 7th of March. Oh, was it March? It was March. Yeah. Before, right before uh, lockdown. lockdown. Oh, yeah. At that stage, we were, uh, you know, touching elbows in the uh, the dressing rooms and, you know, it, yes. it, the, the, the initial kind of you know, almost joking stages of, of COVID at that stage where it was just like, oh, okay, so we have to like not shake hands, we touch elbows now, is this this is what, yes. what it's going to be. And then, you know, days later, all of a sudden, it's like, no, you're not allowed to leave your home for a few weeks. Uh, oh, <laughs> so yeah, so amazing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was definitely, that was the last Taekwondo event that, uh, that I was able to attend. And, uh, you know, I was really looking forward to getting back again this year. And, uh, you yes. know, so yeah, maybe next year. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely, definitely. We'll be back next year. Super, super. Mm. So it was good that we had some. Uh... Go, Go ahead, ahead, Richie. I was just going to say it was good that we had some of your videos. You post a lot of videos on the Techers page throughout the lockdowns, so it gave us yes. uh, plenty of content for us to be looking at at least. So uh, we appreciate that. Plenty of great videos, great clips, because we were only saying that it because the tournaments are now a little bit more. Um, you know, they're, they're much rarer these days. It's hard to get the content out there and the videos of what we want to kind of talk about and the top level guys. So it's uh, it's been fantastic. So we're excited to get through a couple of those videos today as well. No, it's great. I'm glad that you found it useful. I mean, because we were planning to release, you know, current content because we had all the tournaments planned. And then we said, but this is an opportunity to just go through the back catalog of uh, 9,000 videos on my phone and, uh, you know, which we all have 20,000 photos. So I'm glad. Free up a bit of memory. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. A bit of unloading. Yeah. So for the day that's in it, I think we should probably start with uh, what we've titled uh, uh, some techers. Uh, so we're just going to look for, like, so for anyone who's watching, what we plan on doing today is breaking down four finals. So we've got two World Cup finals. We've got two European Championship finals. So from the most recent uh, European Championships in, um, in Bosnia and also from uh, the World Cup in Sydney, in Australia. So uh, it, there's some really nice matches with plenty of talking points in them. But from just those matches, we've pulled out a few very, very nice uh, techniques and uh, a few nice skills. And maybe we'll have a look, look through those and a few quick comments and, and, and discussions over and back on what we like and how we train those maybe. So let's have a little dip in and have a look. Yeah, so I know you're a fan of this one anyway, for sure. A little duck under. It's uh, one that a good friend of yours, Axel, is a big fan of as well. <laughs> That's it, the Matrix. The Matrix, as Axel, yeah. Axel calls it. And Archie also nice. that as well. Yeah, nice, uh, nice. Th this is a, a very unusual shot in particular because it's the reverse of the 360. So uh, uh, Colin goes stepping through from that backside and then throws it with the, uh, the reverse axe kick. So an unusual shot. I've certainly never seen that one before. Mm -hmm. I think it's only Paul Germain maybe that was throwing some variation of a of an axe or a downward hill that you're not ready for. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice blitz then here as well from Tio. You can't yeah. always like to see a nice clear blitz. Good for the scoreboard. Nice shot. Yeah, Ruben holds up well, but the initial the initial contact was good. Mm. Uh, here's a, a juicy one from Anti. Uh, nice right down the pipe. Uh, yeah, you got you got to love a good shot, solid backhand. Some nice great shot here as well from Izzy. Yeah, and some lovely connections, legs to hands from Izzy as well. Um, so mm -hmm. you know, great distance, distance control and great follow on. Yeah, so just some nice shots that you like to see. That's what the Techers is all about. Is that fair to say? Hundred percent. And then I mean, even just in that clip, there's quite a lot because after the initial hook turn is he faints and then comes in so there's so many talking points in terms of change. and then the transition from legs to hands high section you know it's, that was a great uh, few few shots but so much technique in, in what you've showed there yeah and definitely it's a, it's a little bit of a how would you say a, a, a taster of the matches that are coming and the kind of the, the points or the talking points that we might break down uh you know as we go through those so um 
Master De Silva, is there any of those that you'd like to start with? Uh, what what fight would you like to jump into first? Oh, I'm happy. I'm happy to go take take your lead because uh, you picked four great four great fights. I think um, you know if, uh, they've all got sort of a variety of points that we could discuss. I think uh, maybe the one with Colin. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, and Anti, which was uh, mm. you know it was great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know. it, it's one of those fights that on the surface of it, you think, well, look, Colin just has all of the advantages. You know, he's so yeah. tall in that division and so dominant. And it looks like that right out of the gate as well, doesn't it? With the, um, that building of pressure that he's able to do with the extreme range uh, and flexibility he has with that left leg. Well, that's the thing. He really sets the tone from the first, you know, from the start of the fight with that lead leg. Um mm-hmm. Sidekick, which I mean, he I mean he does special technique as well, so he's got supreme control on that. And then, although Anti scored with the reverse after the you know the axe in the clip that we showed earlier, yeah, it's be- you know that was the second round where he'd already established a four flag lead, was really dominating, and you could see more of a variety in what he was doing. Mm. So, the reason I'm with this one is what he does is he really commits on that lead leg sidekick and that's what opens up opportunities for him to score with other techniques and if we go to some other when we look at other fights i felt that perhaps people weren't committing with the lead leg so this is this is kind of how you do it really yeah definitely and i think as well like these guys have fought before they fought in the final in finland 2017 i think so they do know each other they're aware of each other's skills but i think colin does a fantastic job um, he, he completely understands his strengths and his body type and he uses that to maximum ability and really, really controls the distance. Oh, well, and- well, two of the guys in that division who I feel have coped as well as possible with with Colin are uh, Colin Car- Carroll and also Terrell. And mm-hmm. both of them have such a fast blitz, points fighting, uh, point fighter blitz. Mm, and it, yeah, it really... Good show. Good. see some of it here as well. Like one of the most common questions that were asked, you know, is, you know, how do you go about fighting a taller opponent, particularly when they're leggy? And, you know, the, one of the answers is, and Anti has certainly gone that route, is, well, I'm going to pretty much forget that I own legs and uh, I'm going to focus on, set, you know, adjusting my distance and only using the legs as a follow on to a blitz or an engagement with hands. And it, it is simply because the range control that's there when you have that advantage with that front leg. It's exactly the same in boxing when you've got someone with, you know, longer arms. They have that uh, advantage over the jab. You know, we've got that same thing here developing in our taekwondo. And it, it, it means you have to work really, really hard as the shorter fighter to not concede warnings and not concede mm. too much ring space. Well, I think if I, if I plug another one of your videos, another one on our channel, it's the fight between uh, Axel and Andre Lee at the World Championships. So, I mean, that was a, a total masterclass in design, because if you look crazy, I don't know how Andre makes that, that, weight, that weight class. But um, in terms of action, some people might say there wasn't much action, but, it, but if you're looking at technique and as a coach or instructor, just the understanding of distance there, it was just one shot. I think it was one punch that won it. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, you're yeah. quite right, I think. It's understanding that you have to switch to hands and sort of Axel actually spoke to us then after that uh, we ended up chatting with him a little bit about that uh, breakdown so it was, it, it was interesting to do a breakdown and then chat with the fighter in it and say look did we mm. did we get your strategy right you know was that what was going through your head and he said yeah yeah it was just for him it was about playing that game where you wanted to keep the, the score really really low keep it a very negative match from that point of view and then be the guy who gets the one score um, and wins it and you know it's risky, but he felt like the, that's the game that I have against Andre. And, you know, in, mm. in, in this, it's a little bit different. But I think this match with Colin and Ante changes on that really unusual step through reverse downward kick where, yes. you know, Colin gets three of his four flags, uh, you know, on that particular shot. And from there, the match is completely changed because now Ante can't play that game. He now has to go out and find, and unfortunately, because he's blitzing, he's going to need three separate scoring occasions probably, unless he can get a you know a good kick on the end of it. And even that, that's hard against Colin because you're not going to get a headshot off the end of that blitz against Colin very easily. So mm. you're, you're pretty much saying to Andy, no, 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 you have to get your timing impeccably right, and 
absolutely uninterrupted score. So there's no messing, there's no, there's no clash, there's no nothing. You've got to get a clean score on three separate occasions while not conceding warnings to get yourself back into this match. So, you know, it's a real challenge on your concentration and, you know, it, 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 it really puts the initiative way back with, the, uh, with Colin in this one. Definitely. I think, I think the concentration, it's great that you raised that, is, is key because it, it's so hard for the shorter fighter or the one who is playing that game because one slip up, it's game over, really. Mm. Or you're really back. And then you're, or if you concede that headshot, you've got to change the game plan. That's four minutes of concentration. And, and I think, yes, I think that was the turning point because because uh, Colin had set the tone with that lead leg sidekick. It was yeah. very strong, but Anti would, you know, he moved, changed distance. But once that axe kick came in, suddenly you have other things to think about. And then I think it affects the confidence, really, of the fighter. Mm. I said this yeah, is and I think the building the tone. Ahead, you were t- I was just saying, this is the building the tone. It's, it's the uh, Colin refusing to fight in the center of the ring. I think is one of the, the first things because you know percentage wise if you're up against someone who like Antti is well able to go into the point side of things um, you know you don't want you want to have room behind you to retreat from the blitz too or to give yourself range like because Colin needs the range on his legs he doesn't want Antti to be able to get inside that longer range and pressure him so as you said that uh, that kind of setting of the tone setting of the range and control of the range is actually quite a skill from colin it looks like it's just easy being the taller fighter but it actually does require a really good understanding of distance and contr- uh, uh, and and timing to keep uh, that contr- or to keep the, the the control there the patience as well is important isn't it because he controls that as you said but he doesn't like oversell it on his first or second one he's trying to squeeze the space patiently and then it just takes away options that anti has so automatically the opportunities that he has to shoot are now taken away because his space has been reduced every single time and then when he sees the opportunity then colin goes for maybe a big shot yeah i think this is the big shot isn't it nice that's the one there there's nothing to be said about it that's just a big shot <laughs> mm. <laughs> Yeah, and as as well, like like I think when you f- fight somebody like this, the the worst thing you can do is just keep conceding space. And I think that we've seen a couple of clips here when Anti actually kind of held his ground and didn't retreat, and he was set out his stall to go forward, no, no matter what Colin brought. Then he's seen a nice return for himself as well on that. I think. I think the second round, um, it'd be interesting to see the individual breakdown for the mm. two rounds. That's yeah, definitely not the right one. I'll go find, make sure I get the right video for that. Yeah. So, uh, this is just one of those little things that you do everything perfectly and then that happens. But yeah, no problem. <laughs> I, I, I can fix it. So this is the very start of the fight, actually. This is the first few seconds. And what was good there was, you see how Anti was moving uh, to his right and then moved to the left? Yes. You know, he changed, but he actually, if you see after that axe kick, he actually just thought, sort of kept moving in one direction as well. Mm. So yeah, it was you got to switch that up, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think like like Anti's um his his game plan is correct definitely, but it, if you just had more moments where he didn't concede the space to Colin's front leg, and I think Colin recognised that, and when he brought that front leg up. It just reduced the options that he had. And then when he did go and he didn't concede space, like Anti had some great um, returns there himself, which is like this one is a nice one where he's getting Colin on the back foot. So that that's nice to see as well. I think actually, you know, we mentioned there about using the hands is so important, but we actually seen one clip of Anti sneaking in a nice sidekick of his own. And I think that's a, a yeah. very underrated weapon against the taller fighter that you can use. That we just, here we go, like holding your ground and picking your moments. It's picking your moments, but not conceding the ground every single time, isn't it? You can't just let Colin take control and push you on the back foot completely. Well, th- well there's something that, you know, I work on with my guys. Um, but it's where, you know, where someone has got such a strong chamber or lead leg, mm. um, you're countering. It's basically kicking to clash, almost yes. recognizing that you may not yep. get the score. And I think a lot of the, obviously the experienced guys or are, are friends and colleagues that they're, they're doing this but some of the younger black belts are always looking for a score or or, 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 some, or some result with it but sometimes they need to understand that by making the contact obviously you're not trying to kick them in the leg but recognizing yeah. that you're going to engage the leg and then thinking about 
the score after that something that they could possibly do mm. even and the little dip actually... into the stance there to tempt Collins go high is impressive because um, you know as he does that uh, and Colin coming from high Colin dropping is going to give Antti a much better chance to get in because the leg's going to drop heavier coming from high so you know a little subtle body movement like that you know really really quite important but we have some great clips as well with Izzy and Arena Lee later where the um, exactly that the kicking to spoil or kicking to clash is uh, you know very useful in getting her to hands again against a slightly taller opponent mm -hmm. yeah I love, I love the shaft of Antti as well it's just like he's yeah, not conceding lovely. anymore and he's just like yeah I'm going for it here and then he, the first one doesn't work out. He takes the back step again. And he gets the backhand in. Super sweet shot. Ah, oh, yeah. He, a, he, he was much more positive in that second round. He fought very well, you know, given, you know, the physicality, you know, everything sort of against him, so to speak. But he fought, he, I did think he fought well. I think it was more mm. moments, he said. I, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's like that, you know, what happens sometimes, you go into the match with your game plan. And the game plan is great until you get punched in the mouth, as Mike Tyson says. But the, you know, or you know, spinning axe kicks in, you know, in in the head, whatever it happens to be. That was definitely not in Anti's game plan, and everything after that is a reaction to the new game state. And you know, it, it it's going to take time to you know to enact a new plan and really go for it. And yet, it probably should have happened after sixty seconds in round one. Um, but you know, that's one of the challenges with playing a patient, low scoring less front foot kind of game is that sometimes you find that everything is level and it's all going great until the last 15 seconds when the other person gets a score goes two one one up and all of a sudden now you have to work and the time isn't on the clock to do it and you know we've seen that so often and you know even let's say take one of uh, my fighters so jamie williams against uh, vitali in uh, uh, i think in dortmund i think in dortmund uh or sorry not in dortmund but in germany in Insel. um you know you kept the score very 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 close the whole way um but then needed one warning or one point to to take the win and there's only 15 seconds left and then that's just not ideal you know you you've you've now got mm. that additional time pressure um whereas you know if if the if the match is open from the beginning you know it develops differently i think that's the that yeah. that's what you can see from a match like that Based on that as well, I think that the fact that Colin was racking up the warnings throughout that, it, it helps that massively. Even if he didn't get that big headshot or whatever, and the scores were level like we're saying, it's it's those warnings that are racking up. And eventually we see it at the end of matches and it just flips the whole score. But the work has been done throughout the two rounds to build those up. Mm. And that's what Colin's really good at as well. He's able to keep people at the end of his leg and push people back. And it's like, it's the worst place you can be is at the end of the leg, but he forces people there. Henning there, just backing up what you're saying there. Uh, you know, yeah, that's what you have to do. I've never found myself able to get close to him to stop the the leg. And, you know, this is the thing. I mean, yeah. Colin is, what, eight times European champion now for a reason? Um, you yeah. know, <laughs> I think it's eight times he, he, he's managed to nail that. Uh, but, the you know, it's because most people can't solve that problem or they can solve it once. So he has lost, he does lose. But you can't you know it's getting people to do it consistently round after round after round it's it is a different story you know and um, i was only uh, listening to uh, jamie's podcast there the other day as well talking with ken edwards about um uh lu Zhao, i think was or the the, the chinese uh, wt fighter that he fought in the london london olympics at off oh, bones of seven foot give or take and it's like mm -hmm. well ken edwards is tall enough but like seven foot something else as well and when you're working around those kind of ranges and angles this is the kind of thing that you'd face going into colin it's an unusual height advantage that he has so you it never takes experienced him. that training yeah you don't i mean who gets to like yeah. unless you're a kid uh sparring people you shouldn't be sparring you know it, it's not usually something that that develops mm -hmm. i mean his chamber is most people's sort of neck height it's, oops we'll jump it's, back uh, I was actually just jumping here into the one with uh, Arena and Izzy because it, it, it's actually, it's not as profound a difference in height, but it's, no. you know, it is very much the, uh, uh, you know, a similar kind of problem within the, uh, the, uh, the division. And like, Izzy's small, Arena's not particularly tall, but at 50, I think this is at 50 kilos, isn't it? Um, like you can see a slightly different approach in terms of like is he's more active uh, than Andy would have been maybe in changing the distance and changing the angles, um, and I think as well as the fight develops much more active in spoiling. Mm -hmm. Well, he's got great great movement, 
both laterally and she's there fainting with the body and with the hands and uh you know lovely x-ray fantastic i think i think what i would say is that arena didn't have the the control of the lead leg you know izzy didn't didn't fear yeah. it or didn't have to be worried about it uh in the same way that auntie did at the beginning of the of, of their yeah, I think to borrow your point there, you're talking about uh, Colin's chamber being the, the problem, and I don't think Arena presents quite the same threat with her chamber. Mm, I think the carry as well is a little different, isn't it? A lot of time in the female divisions, we see um, the girls kind of carry it a, a little bit more controlled. And I think Izzy is one of those fighters who actually comes quite aggressive off that front leg. She's not trying to kind of flick out the fine range. She's actually trying to hit you with that shot every time. It's like a jab, yeah. literally. And she's just poking at it with, with that front leg. And then when you mix that in with the, the nice footwork and the ability to get the hands really quick, it's really difficult then to get a read on that. It's like, okay, I can't get past her front leg like you've seen here. It's just like she's putting that up. You can't get through it. And then when she mixes that in with the hands and she's able to do that really well because she's always on balance, it's a, it's a massive thing to have to be able to link those two together really well. Wonderful sequence of, or patient sequence there with the spoiling. Like she must have spoiled five, six shots there before getting to hands. Richie sort of with Izzy, I mean, has threat with the legs and hands. But if you look at the weight distribution, Irina tends to favour the back leg. So you sort of really can, I mean, it's easy when we're watching the fight afterwards, but you can really see that she's trying to set up the lead leg, whereas Izzy will switch between hands and legs mm -hmm. more. There's more variety in the initial attack, at least. I think she so got a, a bit of a shin or a knee there. <laughs> No, that's a great point because I think it's important because if you keep the same distance the whole time, um, it, it's easy for the person then to maybe get a read on it. Once they have a read, then then they can use that to, to score more shots. But Izzy is, is very um, effective with the way she's given people that longer range where she can use her own front leg really well. And then she can mix that up, like you said, with the hands at a different range, a little bit closer. So it's always a, a threatening. And then when, especially when you're trying to, when you're trying to chase her and get the lead, and then she has both of those options as well. It's, it's even harder for somebody to go and get the win back. I think going back to uh, Johan's point there as well, though, like once Arena commits to being on the back leg, I mean, this used to be a feature of a lot of the German fighters of the like the like 2000, late 2000s kind of thing, where, you know, almost the back foot would be turned backwards even. It was so pronounced with some of the guys. But uh, once you commit to having the weight towards the back leg, if your front leg is spoiled, you're already going to be off balance so there's that element because you know if we were talking about lifting to carry the the first thing that you know is we, when we talked with uh, Dominic going back probably a year ago at this stage when that front knee comes up if you have the mobility to be able to bring the front leg up directly and have your weight your uh, center of gravity forward of your back foot it really helps get that carry and that, that ability to go forward and if you are clashed you still have momentum you still have body weight with you you're over the top but if your mm. initial movement is to lean back and you get clash there you'll continue to go backwards because you know you're you've moved your your body weight backwards and now you've got an additional force pushing you so you know it is just that thing the spoiling was extra effective i think because of arena's body position but definitely but, we're looking at this point about come up in the next video with uh, in in the one fight with julio there's one you know he's got a very strong lead leg side but there's one ch element where he's in the corner where he sort of is just adjusting his knee almost WT style, which is exactly that. So suddenly you're thinking, oh, is he a side kick, front kick? Is he throwing a question mark over the shoulder? Because you don't see many of us, you know, us doing that, you know, many of the guys doing that. But he's, he, yeah. it is something that he's been because he's got such control over his, his movement forward with, while in chamber. Yeah, you can keep it versatile, you can keep it dynamic, and uh, it, it does keep the options open. And, you know, Julio absolutely loves that blindside turning kick as well. So if he does yeah. have the opportunity to go uh, to go over the blindside shoulder, he loves that. So being able to threaten the side kick, the hook kick, and then come blindside uh, shoulder is like it's a huge tool for him. Um, we might just have a look there, and like we've picked out a couple of clips with Izzy really providing a barrier uh, to Irina and not letting her through. Um, 
But again, it just, it just kind of serves to kind of maybe illustrate as well how effective the shorter opponent can be against the taller opponent by having good control of the, the distance and a real, uh, I'd like to call it, a good sighting of the hip on the way through. Like she's putting her foot where it needs to be around Arena's chamber to disrupt that kick. Mm. I think what's great about how Izzy performed in, in this fight is although she's moving laterally and Irina is controlling the middle of the ring, Izzy for me is the aggressor. She's very aggressive because you're almost waiting for her to attack because she's moving around, moving around, waiting for the gap, spoiling and then aggressive. I think a lot of people sometimes think that to be aggressive you have to be going forward. You know, She's definitely not doing that but she's, she's very positive or positive at, at least, very positive in, in her approach. Master we speak about um, we were just uh, a comment there that you might be a bit quieter than we are at the moment. Um, oh. I don't think I can bring you up directly from here, but if you can uh, raise, raise the input the or bring the mic closer, that would be fantastic. Yeah, mm. is that better? I, we, we, I'm sure we'll get a comment. A bit louder, I think. I th I'm sure mm. we'll get a comment in a moment or two if uh, if we've got it right. I suppose it's better than being too loud and they don't want to hear what I'm saying. So, apologies. Yeah. <laughs> Henning, you might let us know if we're if we're closer to be, being on balance there. Um, um, but you were just speaking there about about that control. It's like we always speak about the three controls that you have. It's like distance, the spacing, where you are in the ring, and then the tempo. And I think that Izzy really controlled the tempo and the distance, although she wasn't always in the center of the ring. And I think that that's what really allows her. Although Irina stayed in the center, she didn't really have the control of the tempo of the of the boat and the distance and then that's where it allowed Izzy to kind of take control more definitely I think yes I, it was almost like Izzy was waiting for her to kick and then so in, even in that regard was controlling who was initiating the the attack and so that she mm. could counter uh, it's a, like again it, we, we always come back to principles and you know when you're in a match like that you know you're looking for what can you control and you know arena is taller it's going to be very hard to dominate the center and keep the center of the ring from her uh but in choosing uh the where in the ring the engagement happens by ma managing the distance and managing the tempo of it uh, and i think what what i really liked through um uh through izzy's movement was she was able to uh be first and on top with her front leg which obviously gives her advantage in those exchanges and when she couldn't be she found the hip so she was able to kind of put her heel put her foot over arena's hip and stop her leg from being effective because we can't extend the you know the kicking leg once it gets trapped like that and you know it i think it's just a perfectly valid strategy when you're uh when you're up against it in terms of the your height versus your opponent's height or your reach versus their reach so no, do we want to have sorry variables that I think definitely, you know, Izzy's controlling the variables that are in that that she has control over that she could uh, influence. It was very good. So we let's have a look at that uh, that that final again. So the same championships, and uh, uh, I'm going to apologise in advance because I don't know if it's Jack Eilerston or Eilerston Jack or whatever way because it, it's a little Jack bit Eilerson, like yeah. Jack Eilerston for sure. So Richie has the the uh, the first hand knowledge yeah. there maybe. Um, yes. But, uh, I think Jack we, we, actually spent a bit of time in the USA. He's fighting Julio, who's obviously from New York. So I think Jack's a nice kid. Uh, yes. Some guy, yeah. I think he actually spent a bit of time in, in the, the States himself. Uh -huh. Okay. So this is the this is the in-person knowledge. Yeah, I'm missing that. I, I, I've never actually met him. So there you go. Yeah, and Julio is a... Is a, a prominent feature on the on the Tekkers channel as well I guess isn't he because he's just yeah. he's got a, a very unique style and he's great to watch uh, and he's an ex extended member of the the team as well but <laughs> Jack started really positively really positively mm -hmm. you know if you look how aggressive he was right at the onset faking and then I think Julio there it was that lead leg turn that suddenly really was qu quite happened quite quickly that you could see the tempo yeah. switching it was almost like Julio was waiting saying fine you can move around and then but there, that, that's this is the area here where he was yeah. changing the knee chamber. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's very, very effective. Like we call it like an, almost like a recoil where he floats it outwards and he pulls it back to the chest and it's like, oh, what can happen from here? And it's it, the power then he gets on it and the explosiveness as well. It's incredible. 
Yeah, for some people that would actually be like a little bit of a giveaway and would give you an opportunity to counter them as the knee comes back. But the way he uses it, he actually disguises how much he's carried in his bottom foot. So the range that he has uh, is, is really quite variable. So you might think you've got him ranged. And then as the knee comes back, he makes a bigger shift with the bottom foot and all of a sudden he's, you know, six inches, eight inches closer. Uh, so that's, that's a real mental effort to keep track of or to you know to try you you, you know it's very hard to develop a very good feel for julio's distance mm -hmm. yeah like johan you mentioned at the start as well about um the spoiling in one of the first fights we watched and what do you think of of julio's spoil here that he uses with the front turning kick kind of like underneath i think he, he does oh, that fantastic. quite well oh lead, it was lead leg right underneath he threw about three or four times made contact mm. you know straight away because where you're expecting him to boss it with the, that lead leg side, it's almost like when he's countering, he's got an answer as well. Yeah, yeah. It's a unique way of spoiling that leg as well. It's not like the traditional side kick or the clash and go that we might see. Yes. Well, because by coming underneath the guard, you start, I guess the opponent will start wondering whether their chamber is too high and start affecting their chamber. When the chamber is mm. lower, we saw that it's not as effective. So it's uh, creating a lot of problems. Yeah. Right. It does get to a, a point in the match as well where, you know, this trampoline style kick, you know, where the, the foot is dropping and dropping and raising into the chamber and he's varying his distance off of that, Julio in this case. Um, you know, it, this is something that you'd say Jack could pressure. Like there, there's definitely gaps technically in it where you could put pressure on, but you have to be mentally in the right state to be willing to go and take that risk and pressure Julio. And I think what's happened is Julio's brought this in a little later in the match where, you know, Jack isn't quite willing to pressure him anymore he you know he, he does he's, he's going to take the safe shots and the safe options but i don't think at this stage in the match he's willing to you know to to, to uh, i suppose trust his instincts and hit the dropping leg well i mean you know julio has um he came and taught a seminar here in london for the team and then i was teaching out with him in argentina and you know you said about it's very hard to read his distance, but also the power he gets on that lead leg yeah. sidekick. Is, it's a very strong shot. So maybe by that stage, you know, the confidence has gone. It's, uh, once you get, mm. Even if you're not conceding points, when there's contact there, then you, you know, it starts raising other questions in, in, in the opponent, I think. But so the threats that he gives... Like mm. he's he, the threatening uh, ability that he has with the, like the multitude of shots that he brings out as well. I think that like as you actually mentioned, Jack started really positively and really well, mm. and I think that then like towards the end of it, when he was like, okay, there's potential of me getting hit as I come in, and then towards the end we see him go a little bit more direct route. But in that middle phase there, I think he was just a little bit conscious of what could come, and I think a lot of that actually plays off that what we call like the springboard psychic. Um, and they were actually both doing it, which is interesting. It's it's very rare to see both guys doing it, where they kind of initiate off the front leg drop and use like a, the kind of like the springboard of the ground to kind of get more of a push off. But I think Julio's ability to come with so many different shots off it is very very threatening. Where Jack's doing a great job, but he's going back with the side kick every time, um, of using that bouncing off the ground to get a bit of momentum. Where Julio can actually bring the turning kick, the, whatever he wants, and it, it's it's a big threat. Well, in the previous sort of batch of uh, clips, Julio does a fake with that lead leg, really high chamber, and then he goes over the top with the back fist. And again, mm. he's created that opportunity because you're waiting for the strong side kick to either hit you in the yeah, ribs. Yeah. yeah, that one there. You know, yeah. and I've, I've seen him do that time and time again. You'll see him. But he set the tone because now the person is side kick or prepare the side kick or defend against the side kick and the side kick's not there. He's an absolute master at setting and breaking the rhythm. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, that, that does give you huge advantages. And I, I think a, a big thing as well, it, it's so disarming when you spar somebody and you're, you're throwing your shots, you're making your best effort to make contact and either you're, you're getting the distance wrong, you know, they're controlling the distance well and you're missing, or you're walking onto a counter like that psychic there, you know, you, you've taken your shot and it hasn't worked worse than not hitting. It's actually, uh, you know, the person is just kind of, copped it and you know after a minute or two of that you become very hesitant to you know to, to really take a chance and throw anything and i mean this is the end of a big division um you know so jack has come through some good rounds against good opponents to get here um and you can see just the match degrades you know how you know difficult it, it can be 
once you start to feel that momentum slide away from you. Uh, he had a great he had a great uh, tournament. You know, it was a it was it was a strong it was a uh, number of fighters in division and a strong division. But uh, yeah, I think the com cumulative effect of when you're attacking, getting countered effectively, and then their strong attack, aggressive attack from Julio as well, the confidence can go slightly, or you start questioning yourself. Well, again, I suppose you have to you have to start with well, what can I take? control of again versus Julio and, and the, mo the most common answer for everybody is well I'm going to go to the centre of the ring and I'm going to take that um, and you know sometimes that just doesn't doesn't play well <laughs> you know and, and, and it, 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 yeah. it he almost it, wants you to be there yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's a challenge because you know it, again it, it, it appears to most people to be the option simply because he's willing to give it a lot of the time um, and what Julio does so well is he pulls you in. It's, it's like, you know, the, the, the spider with the we in the web. You know, he pulls you in, pulls you in, pulls you in. And then when you've overextended, he explodes outward. So it's, it's like he, he's pulling you in, but he's just that spring ready to, you know, explode outwards again. And it makes it, you know, that bit challenging. So uh, I think, you know, if you're going to fight Julio, you can't fight him on his terms. You've got to bring yes. the tempo to something that suits you and not him and in most cases that's slowing the tempo which you know is a mm -hmm. it's a very nerve-wracking thing to do sometimes you know so to, to fight someone at a slower tempo means sometimes you're having to spoil more you're having to stand in the center more and you're having to engage with hands on the first intention more so in other words you know as Julio's looking to lift that first chamber which we know might not be a shot you're having to be willing to engage with that it's hard but, you know, if you're going to take control of something, you've got to not let Julio fight the match that he wants to fight and, you know, and, and bring your own advantages to play. I mean, there so, are so many mm. great fighters in all the divisions, uh, junior, senior, you know, male and female fighters, obviously. But in terms of rhythm and distancing, I think Julio is up there with the best in terms of just being able to control the rhythm and change the pace and the tempo. So exactly as you say, if he's allowed to do that, it's going to be a long, going to be a tough day at the office if you're, if you're going to allow him to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And you spoke as well earlier about um, focus at the start of a, a contest where somebody's coming out and, and they have an intention. And I think that yes. Julio, like the mental fatigue that he brings to his opponents, because not only does he have all these fantastic skills, but the fact that he's very high energy in the ring as well and I, he's very very used to that obviously because it's what he does so mm. i think towards the, the later stages of the second round he just mentally burns people out with it with the test the reactions they have to do mm. and it's just very very hard to get any bit of a read on him and he's just he's just excelling that's what he does all the time so i think that just the, the mental fatigue and the the kind of the, the fitness that he can keep both physically and mentally i think is a massive thing as well which people kind of don't recognize until they get in there with him I think, uh, well, he did some incredible training with Master Palaza. I think over the last year, people have had, might have had a bit of insight on his Instagram, yeah. just the, the variety. And, you know, he's training every single day. He doesn't take a rest day. He, you know, he doesn't have a, a rest day because, we're you know, we're good friends. So we, we talk, but, you know, and Master Palaza has some wonderful techniques and systems. So, you know, I'm, I'm waiting. I'd love the opportunity to go and train out there with him. Uh, at Queen's. Some creative so, stuff. Yeah, but I think that's I think that's one of the things that he does so well is the dis and Master Palazzo in this case is like it's disguising the repetition. So I mean, if you're going to do all of that fitness training, all of that, uh, you know, that those technical progressions and, and nuances, but you can hide it all. Like it's always done a little differently. We'll try it this way this week. We'll try it this way this week. The focus is often on the exact same strengths, but we're going to just spice it up, add a little flavor to it. You know, stretch the imagination, do it a little differently. So because you know, Julio's been around the game a long time. And if he was doing the same drills and the same exercises and the same activities for 10 years, you know, mm. he's probably not still in this game because he's going to be burned from them. It, it, you know, it gets mind-numbingly boring to be doing the same things because then it's, it's all discipline. Where if you're like, you're going to training going, what is he going to have me doing today? How am I going to achieve this? What's the challenge? Yeah. What's, the, what's the solution to this new challenge? Your, your brain is actively engaged all the time. And I think there's a lesson mm. for us as coaches in terms of, you know, what can we borrow from Bill Perlazza there? And, you know, um, in, in terms of how do we make sure we can get the same things, that, like focus on what we want the focus to be on, sure. But how do we do, how do we innovate around, you know, 
uh, making the, the same challenges appear in new and, uh, and, and mentally engaging ways. And I think that's, that also plays into the concentration element because you can't maintain that physical pressure without really strong concentration. You know, your ability to focus and concentrate for that length of time has to be superb because otherwise you'll do what everyone else does. You fall into natural rhythms. You, you know, you start to react to your opponent rather than lead. I mean, everybody does it at some point. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, the concentration to maintain the initiative for four minutes, it's actually a lot harder than it sounds. That's very hard, and I, yeah. I think it's great because it, it's it's great. It's important for the coach as well as the athlete, because it keeps things creative for for both for, for all parties. And uh, no, no, it's it's a high high level of concentration, and then that comes with high level of training, high level of fitness. It's uh, it's it's you know it's, it can't be underestimated the work that goes into that. So for our final match this uh, this afternoon, we have two relatively new. Uh, guys to the scene in terms of the senior 63s uh, and the final of the European Championships from Bosnia. So we have Ruben Williams from England and uh, Theo Lutz from uh, Norway. And uh, I think Theo's first senior competition, first or second senior competition. Um, So uh, quite new on that one. And Ruben has certainly been senior for a few years. Um, I think he's been to the final before, has he? I don't know that one. He fought Matt Cadle in Scotland. That's right. Uh, all all England final, uh, mm. which was wonderful as as a coach there to see that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I think he's got bronze as well. So definitely. And that's yeah. an addition, you know. That, yeah. So Ruben's still quite young. I mean, I think he's only twenty three, twenty four. I had the pleasure of coaching him. All great guys. So my opinion, Panthers as well. Third down. Uh, yeah. In Ireland. Super. So we'll have a have a look at this one, and uh, it starts off with very much a statement of intent, I think, from uh, from Theo as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like th- this one is um, it's very closely matched. We were kind of looking at heights and stuff earlier, but I think these guys are more evenly matched, and I think it yeah. comes down to a bit of a battle on the front leg, front hand, um, for most of this fight, mm-hmm. and each one are trying to kind of stamped their own on it really um, you can see Ruben here is trying to get a bit of momentum going off that front leg but um, the, the rhythm that Theo comes with that blitz is actually very interesting and it's a, like we were speaking earlier it's a hard one to read and he just picks the right moment every time now, I thought he did very well in terms of interrupting the rhythm for Ruben Ruben's a, a great mm-hmm. kicker and, and, and he's got a very strong blitz himself but yeah. that very you see the, the start of the fight that big step in from Theo as well, you know, he he sort of meant that Ruben wasn't really committing a kick. Um, it was being thrown out there, but there wasn't any sort of real strength or force behind it, which again gives more confidence. Um, yeah. To to the blitz. I I do think Ruben's biggest strength is his ability to go forwards and backwards on that front leg. He balances himself very very nicely and he carries mm-hmm. forward well. But but he like from the drop he can go into a retreat really easily. Um. You know, and it does offer him an opportunity to then connect to hands. Uh, what you don't tend to see from Ruben is like you know a switch back kick or you know uh, um, uh, moving out to the uh, and hitting the towards the open side with a turning kick off the back leg or you know you don't see hit the the variety of shots that way. So I think as Richie was saying, like you know it, it tends to be that you know front leg front hand kind of a, a game, which means what we're watching is a very linear fight. It's about the ability mm-hmm. to control distance, rhythm, and timing in that straight line. And it, like Theo's um, arms are actually quite long as well as I'm looking at this. He's getting great reach on his front hand, isn't he? And speaking of like the likes of Colin and that earlier, like the using your strengths and the, the talents, I guess, if you want want to a better word, that you have naturally to be able to kind of use them and bring them to the forefront for your game. No, definitely. I think, you know, this was a, it was a very close fight in terms of, you know, the, the, the fighter, the, the way that they approached it. And I just mm. think that where, if you look at Colin's fight, he was able, I mean, obviously he's got the physicality, but he was able to assert himself with that lead leg sidekick. Ruben wasn't able to, to do that in the same way. Because he had a very good, very good round, you know, very good couple of rounds. Mm. Yeah, like it was, as you said, close is like the the last one there, the minus point. Other than that, yeah. it was actually only there was still one flag available to make it 2-2 and it very could have easily been a draw and an extra round but um, 
the minus point there. Well, I mean, there maybe were two minus up. points given in that one to each. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I personally wasn't able to identify either, why either of them. I agree. Minus point. Definitely, yeah. We'll have to have a look at that. So this is the this is the first one. Yeah. There's another clash, like you mentioned earlier yeah. as well, from Theo. Yeah, that's just beautiful timing, as far as I can yeah. see. It's a strong lead leg turn from Theo underneath. He waited for Ruben to drop the the leg. He led with the lead arm, and he followed up with a cross. I, I, don't, I really don't see what the what was, what was happening. Yeah, we were like we've spoken about this a few times about like how maybe on the centre ring that when there's people from the umpire committee and stuff watching, it's like. Sometimes the referees may feel a bit nervous themselves and like they have to perform as well. And there's a, there's a pressure for them to kind of have an impact on the match. Whereas sometimes the, the best referees are the ones that you don't even notice are there because oh, they just definitely. they can leave a free flow. Yeah, well, I mean... In that... all respects, it's easy for us to, to watch the fighters True. and say they could have been more positive and equally... I, it's, you know, I, I didn't spot the warning then or, or the reason... Uh, but I think everyone is doing the best job that they can and they're doing a great yeah. job and you're quite right that under pressure uh, to, to perform and make sure that they're not letting anyone else the competitors down and themselves down. So but I, I mean I in that instance I didn't I couldn't recognise what was what the difficulty was. I think there's an element as well that happens with gala finals and things like that as well where, you know, we often see that you know, referees are expected to be completely professional. But one of the challenges is they may only do that once every two years. So you cannot Red habituate point. to it when and to the, the environment. I mean, we love it in the crowd, you know, whether we're coaching, competing or in the crowd, you know, when you have the big lights, you have the, all of the attention on the one ring, you maybe the, you have the spotlights, you have the, 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 the halftime entertainment, whatever you have, you know, and it's a huge occasion. And we talk about it from the competitor's point of view that sometimes it throws them because they're not used to doing that. That doesn't happen as often for them. But for the referees as well to be paraded out and everybody is watching and they're very the centre referee I think in particular is very conscious that they're being watched. And that all doesn't always mean that they're they end up with a better performance because of it. Sometimes it does mean that they start to like read into things, they preempt things. Um, you know, they, they go with what they expect. They you know, they do normal human things. They basically like they chunk uh, information and they jump to the natural conclusion of that sometimes even when it doesn't happen like and you know we, we talk about this a lot with scoring where you sometimes see a score given or a score not given and when you watch it back it's all very very clear but in the moment as the information yeah. is being processed maybe it wasn't and we've seen that sometimes as a coach particularly would say you know you see the reverse turning kick and I had a good chat with Jamie on this one it's like because we came out of a, a fight that he was in and I was like very unlucky to have been scored against that reverse turning kick it was clearly on the glove and he looks at me he's like well no i heard you but no that hit me i was like i i saw that clearly land on the glove i i i'm sure of it and we watched the video back and it was one like we've seen it in some of the slow motion replays where it goes one down and then the glove comes up and there's a moment where like after the kick is actually landed you see the the recoiling leg you know at the arm because the, the arm is on its way up it's just hit and then it appears here. Mm. Like, in my view as the coach, I was 100% convinced in real time that hit the glove. Mm. But of course, referees saw what they saw. And in, in, some case, in this case, saw it better than I did. Um, it, it can be challenging from that point of view as well. But like, uh, we do have a second um, minus point at the finish here, which is also... On the exit, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is where it's close. You see here it's 3-1 and you're like, okay, Theo's in the lead. But actually, you can see very closely um, on the one flag there, if he pulls that back, it's a draw 2-2. Two, two. So although it might look like 3-1 and four, it's a clear win. The, mm. I just didn't see that. Unless that lead arm was construed to be a push, but even then it wouldn't be a minus point. But there's another point. You know you talked about the pressure the centre referees on. I think the yeah. jury president walked up here maybe after this. And there's still only one warning, uh, one minus point each. So again, these are all things. Oh yeah. That, you know, can be. I think yeah, yeah. was it one or was it two? I mean, I I know we're working. Oh. I I edited this one. It it may have been Ruben second uh, minus or something like that, uh, because yeah, they, 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 the the one of the member of the technical team is to be there sure. if there's two, if someone's on two minus points. So you're not meant to have a disqualification, you know, uh, without them. But yeah, but like. But 
I missed it because I thought it was one for Theo, one minus for Theo from here and one yeah. for Ruben. But that, you know, I understand when the jury president comes. But again, there's huge pressure for everyone. Everyone is doing yeah. the, the best that they can do. And, you know, as a coach and as a competitor, we do appreciate the efforts of all of everyone there. Plus the fact that you're uh, shouting there in the background on the video. <laughs> you're in, you're in, the, in, <laughs> yeah. the, in the crow giving it large. <laughs> I had to leave that, that in. That's the only thing with the tech is you get the, uh, absolutely no extra charge. You get free commentary <laughs> from me. <laughs> so looking into this match, uh, you know, for, for its uh, positives from each person, like, you know, we, we talk about the fact that it's such a linear one with front, front leg, front hand exchanges. That battle for control of the space and the, uh, the, the rhythm of the match is, um, becomes really, really important for both guys. Mm-hmm. And we see different ways. So you have Ruben using that, that trampolining and the carry uh, to try and get himself into distance. And you've got um, uh, Theo using uh, those longer, the, the longer stance and the tests into distance. Um, you know, both guys get caught with these defensive sidekicks a couple of times as well as they look to change uh, transition from legs to hands. And Theo uses his lead arm really nicely as well, you know, just to create a bit of contact between with the chamber on the right leg as well Ruben's right leg not necessarily pushing it down every time but just giving him something to think about mm -hmm. and I think there's that thing where uh, Theo does keep his hand by his hip and close to his body most of the time this kind of relaxed position and that kind of sets a range for um, uh, for Ruben to react to and then with some of the tests he extends that arm he, he you know he invades the space a little bit more and it, it, I think it does give him very good information on, you know, when to go with the with the blitz, and it, it gives Ruben bad information, you know, about where how how close they are. So, it's something that you know it's really easy to do. It's really easy to kind of to talk about it, but you have to do it, you know, without it being a really obvious conscious thing. It has to be, um, it has to be instinctive. It ha or okay, instinctive is completely the wrong idea. It has to be uh, unconscious. I think is the mm. maybe the best way to put it. With the, with the battle of control there as well, we're, we're kind of talking about the distance uh, is in, in particular because I think Theo had a great um, control of the distance, which actually allowed him to set those testing and rhythm breaks um, and the footwork that allowed him to get into that front hand. So I think that by him controlling that range where he was just a little bit more comfortable at that range where Ruben couldn't hit him, just, just yeah. out of that range, I think it gave him a great opportunity then to come in with that hand when the opportunity presented itself. And that's where, um, you know, Ruben had a great tournament, but in that fight, I mean, it's easy said and done, but that's where probably you could argue that if one of the options was to either change or be more positive with that sidekick and commit more to, mm. to, to make someone think about it. But it, in the day, if they're affecting the range, so you lose confidence in the kick and you kick, you know, it's, uh, it's easier said than done. He actually came out of the blocks in the second round, Ruben, really quick and really strong off that mm. front leg. Um, so I think that that was actually good. But then it kind of, I think, as you said, when you're in the heat at the moment, it's, it's not as easy to execute. So uh, he, he obviously, that was his intention, but it's not always the easiest thing to, to get off when somebody is doing something in front of you to, that you have to react to as well. I think a very difficult thing as well, and we'll chat as we could break, get into the breaking rhythm here as well, is that when you talk about getting your scores predominantly off of a, off of a psychic, it can be a difficult um, it can be a difficult uh, thing to do productively for the judges because, you know, so often it's only one judge sees it uh, and sees it clearly. Uh, so you know, having that deep impact on the scorecards can be a difficult thing. So like you're looking for Ruben to make a, a definitive contact. Uh, and I think what Theo has managed quite well in, in in doing this, and you know, in particularly in terms of setting and breaking rhythms, is he's managed to not have um, you know a, a point where he's just or not routinely been clipped and moved back in a direct line, giving Ruben the chance to transition easily into hands and build that final score with the turning kick. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, nice shots on the defensives. Sorry, Johan, go for us. I said, no, he, he fought well, you know, he, he did. It is hard. I mean, I've spoken to a number of, um, you know, umpires and, uh, you know, obviously we've, we've done the courses as well. But the fact is, although it might be the main shot that many fighters are using, the lead leg psychic is actually one that isn't scored that often. 
So, mm. you know, because it has to be so clear, or if it does score, as Adrian said, you know, it'll be only one judge, maybe two that will see it. Yeah. Which is yeah. fine as long as the fighters and coaches remember that because then you're using the sidekick to set something else up or or, or to control the tone or the, the rhythm of the fight. But if you're looking for a score, then you have to acknowledge that maybe you need to use a score that is more visible. Is it easier to mm-hmm. score? Technique, sorry, that's easier to score. I actually only did a session on this yesterday with my crew. It was like the difference of shooting to shoot and land a very long sidekick to the body versus shooting the front leg to carry into contact. Mm. And I think that when you when you hit it with the bent leg, it as you said, it's very hard to see visibly. So then you got to think of what's next and maybe the build up after that. Whereas if you're you can use like a direct, very long one, almost kind of like a stabbing motion where that one may be a bit clearer. But again, as you said, it's hard for all judges to see that. Yeah, I think the sidekicks that do get the, the kind of clear score off the judges are the ones where uh, you, the, you you spear someone. It's, it's, it's the spear fishing one. Yeah. You know, so the person has just started to come forward. You get that lovely extension. You get the clean line on the hip. Their hand is raised. Whereas the one that comes back and hits just under the forearm or that just maybe it caught them at the end of distance, maybe it didn't, you know, those things. It's very, very hard. And I, I in looking for some uh, some fights for uh, for last week's episode, I found... A rare thing about six or eight of my own fights and you know look at the amount of sidekicks thrown in my fights because that was definitely do an episode on that oh terrifying but um the like the tension oh man but uh the amount of sidekicks thrown um you know for like might score one per round you know yeah. and, and that's what you're looking at but there could be 20 sidekicks thrown in the round to land the one I mean, someone with better percentages than me is probably going to be landing one in five, you know. Uh, but 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 even that, I wouldn't think so. Like for, in terms of getting clear scores off for referees, it's really quite difficult. So we just have to change how, like you know, if, if someone is looking at it as look, this is my main way to go out and get scores. You have to be pulling people onto it. You have to be, you know, you have to be inviting people and landing them uh, on that sidekick. Otherwise, it should be setting up what's next. And I think, you know. We can see that in the, you know, in, in this battle between, that the guys have had between the front leg and front hand, you know, that the one that's going to be scored most frequently in this battle, if the if the distance is good, is that front hand. Mm. Yes, because that's a visible. You see it making contact with the head, the head moving. Where is that? Yeah, it's it's certainly certainly the case. And even in that particular exchange there, like Ruben has come out with, say, visually the better in the exchange. He, he, he like the um, Theo's ha- ha- direction has been turned and Ruben's got, got what looks like some good solid swings in there. But there's, a, there's an advantage to being first too, you know. So the, the first thing to land is what triggers the referee's attention, of course. So uh, very often... If you're not sure at the end exactly how it's gone, well, you definitely saw that first shot. So that's the one that I'm putting down. Mm-hmm. I think as well that nowadays um, all fighters are way more balanced in terms of their ability to move forwards and backly or backly backwards <laughs> really quickly. I was a word ahead in my in my brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think that that that's the the key to it as well. The fact that if you shoot a sidekick to score it that people are actually just out of range and they're still on balance. And that allows them the ability to throw their front hand to come back into you. Um, and I just kind of like touching on that then, like I'm interested to know, Johan, from your point of view, being in different ITF groups over the years, is there anything that you've seen from other groups which you think would be effective for our ITF and then vice versa, something that we do really well that isn't as prominent in other groups? I mean, what I would say is I don't know if it's related to the respective ITF group, but there's a much better understanding from athletes and coaches as to what's required. So you literally alluded to it with with the movement. You know, you have to be able to move forward and backward and move side to side. I think, you know, with the Chang'un group, obviously they've got a different rule set um, in that they're trying to throw their, you know, they have to score the spinning techniques and and they're limited in the way that the hands are used. So they can't use the blitz or the lead hand in the same way because they, you know, there's only going to be two shots. Um, I think there is a lot more variety. I think, you know, the definitely the kick, but the point fighting wacko influence has come into our ITF 
how our, our, our guys fight. Um, and, uh, you know, they might be very strong on the lead leg psychic, but they stand fully side on. And then in the, you've got the lead arm to read. They can't even throw the backhand because they're fully mm -hmm. side on, you know, adjusting. Or it becomes like a front crawl, you know, over the top with that, with the, with the blitz. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that answered your question, but... Um, no, yeah, yeah. I think, I, think, uh, I, I think there's a lot more awareness, really, and a, and a high level of coaching. And a, and a high level of execution from the athletes. I mean, what I would say is, you know, if you look at the juniors, in, in you know, the juniors are coming straight up into seniors, no problem. And if you watch the juniors, the movement and understanding is is fantastic. You know, when you go to the global events. I think there's actually been like a rinse out almost of so many seniors over the last five years, um, five, six years, where so many people who'd been on the scene for quite a long time have just dropped off really really rapidly i think over the last five or six years and i think a big part of it is exactly that there'd been a, a nice steady progression where people went from junior to senior took two or three years to get their bearings started to work up through the medal positions and into gold you know in their mid-20s or late 20s and stayed there for you know a, a period of dominance maybe and i think what we're seeing is now there's no rhyme or reason to that at all it it it, it works differently you have guys at 18 years of age step up and go no no i'll win this thanks and mm and smash it and stay there for five or six years and are, are still doing well you've got um you know you've got juniors coming up who take a couple of years but then they're right up there so i think yeah the average age in the divisions is dropping massively over the last few years uh, at senior and i mean i would hope that yet yeah, there was a, a a rinse and a clear out but that we're going to see a new generation of people who are you know where the juniors coming up although being super skillful are not so good that they can overcome the skill and nuance and knowledge and experience of the ones mm. that are at senior. Like I, I, I think that would be a nice way to see things develop over the next few years, that the balance gets redressed a little bit. But I think there was, as you said, whether it's because the introduction of the, the, the point fighting style or the you know changing in terms of the general training or physical preparation, whatever changed, um, it was a little too much for a lot of the people who'd been there for a, a long number of years. And it all happened very rapidly. But I'm hoping that we end up with a very healthy and mature senior division over time as well, where you see people from 18 to 34 or 5 years of age, you know, still competing together in the same division for a long number of years. And that would be really good to see. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely. I mean, if you look at the men's division, Vitali has gone straight up from junior to senior world champion. Mm -hmm. Danilo and Alamin straight from junior. He was uh, Alamin 2015 Italy was world champion and went straight up. Yeah. And then Julio, the last six world finals, only won 2015. He hasn't been there. So he did two junior straight into four, into three senior, you know. So it's, uh, I think yeah. it's, it's incredible that they're doing that. But then you've got Hong. You know, yeah, yeah. amazing perform amazing performance. Uh, our friend who uh, you know, you know, it's really it's great to see so many fighters, different ages, either able to make the transition straight away or have that longevity. Yeah, I mean, it's like we've certainly seen it from both ends. Because um, as you said, at the same time as Hong was doing that, the opportunity arose because Adam Shelley stepped out. <laughs> you know, who'd just done that, gone from world champion junior to. Um, to senior uh you know and you know it, it, incredible stuff and some real amazing performances um but as you said it would be like everybody wants a story where you know there's another hong coming and you know where you know you can you can win um you know a european title and 10 years later come back and do it again you know i, I think we all instinctively like that story we want to see that happen you know happen more often um, yeah. but at the same time you can't deny just how impressive it is for some of these young guys who've come on um, and you've picked out you know some of the names there like yeah. you know it, it's, it's superb stuff to see that level of skill coming through the yeah. composure being there that people feel yeah I'm prepared having fought through the junior divisions I'm now prepared to go senior and I think it's it's a great argument as well for potentially splitting that junior division into the like 14, 15 and 16, 17 kind of bracket where you know just a few months ago that senior world champion was junior and it's some ask for a 14 year old stepping onto the mats for the first time to step on the floor with them and achieve anything um so you know i think that's another potential progression 
uh, that we, we can look at over the next few years. Well, well, definitely. I mean, Axel and I have been friends for a long time. I mean, the first, you know, he won um, the World Championships in 2006 in Australia as a junior. And then he went on to win three straight world titles as a, as a senior. I mean, admittedly with Axel, he's probably the same weight that he now that he was he was then. I don't hmm. think he ever has anything with cutting weight. But uh, no, I, it's, it's a great point you raise about the age because I've definitely seen in terms of my own students, in terms of the national teams I'm coaching, there is a difference between a 50, you know, 16, 17, and if they can get a, a, tourna- a championship in at, at the age of 18 because of when they're born, there is a noticeable difference and you would be looking for them to be in the mix at 16, 17, 18 is when they'd be looking to win it. Yeah, you've got the outliers, the fourteen and fifteen year olds, but it, there is a big, big difference. And so, even when they turn up for the first time, you can yeah. see that the, they've done World Cups and European Cups where they are used to a big screen and a big alarm going off when they don't. You know, if someone doesn't make weight, whereas everyone others are sort of a little bit starstruck when they get into that arena. Yeah, that's so true. Because I, I remember from my own personal perspective, I went to the Euros for the first time, two thousand seven. So 2007, 2008, like European Cups, all out, last first round every single time. So from 2007, then 2010, you're kind of at that 18, 17, 18 mark and just things start to click. So I went from like losing first round every tournament for maybe two years internationally to actually going and winning the whole thing in one go. And I think it just makes a big difference for people that at that age. It's just like you almost have to go and get your losses and experience that do the learning as as the junior and then like as you peak into your senior career then a lot of guys are hitting that junior last year as a champion and then they're pushing on to great mm-hmm. things as a senior yes it's, that's that's saying you know you win or you learn that's exactly mm. it so uh, so at this stage, Johan, do you want to maybe uh, share with the, the viewers and listeners here um, some of the stuff that you've been up to, some of the projects that you've got and some of the places where they can go to find uh, your work and some of the, uh, well, what we've said as well is like some amazing production quality on some of the, the videos you've yeah. been putting out recently. So, you know, compliments and well done on that. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I'm a big fan of, of, of your channel and obviously we're all friends anyway, but... Um... No, it's, we've been working really on the app. It's something that I've been working on for two years and released it in May last year. So we've got something planned for the anniversary for the first birthday. That's coming up. Uh, lots of new new projects and modules being released on that. Um, and then really just the focus on the YouTube channel and the guys work incredibly hard on that. So it meant a lot to them, you know, when when you guys recognize the, the production quality and the time and effort that, that goes into it I mean you're familiar with it because you do it yourself as well um, so uh, you know Steph and I the dragon we've got lots planned we're grounded at the moment but the tour is very much in full swing and um, we're, we're, we've got some things planned um, I'll be teaching online too so it's uh, it's really that really and you know uh, we were speaking before we went live but you know we're fortunate enough that we are coming out of lockdown or things are easing slowly here so in terms of that, I'm just working with, with my guys, my students, and it's just lovely to, to see them all. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys get the opportunity to have that as soon as possible as well. And everyone, you know, all our friends around the world who, who are not able to instruct. And of course, for all of us to meet up, you know, meet, mm. up, uh, meet up again soon. Very much so. Yeah, absolutely. So folks, would absolutely recommend that you can find uh, Master Da Silva all over Instagram, all over YouTube. Uh, you'll certainly find him there uh, on the Google Play Store and uh, uh, Apple App Store. You will find the TKD Te- Techers app. So look for uh, TKD Techers uh, or the Silva Taekwondo. You'll find uh, plenty of stuff there. And again, you know, a huge thank you for uh, the the use of all of the videos and, uh, and for your time today coming on to ha- chat through stuff. So very much a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Excellent. And for everybody else, I guess we'll see you next Friday. See you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you.